Bonsoir, mesdames and messieurs. We are live here at the Fantasia Film Festival virtual edition. I will be joined. My name is Matthew Kiernan. I work with the programming team and I will be joined very soon by the makers of the filmmakers and the cast, all two of them, of Alone. Joining me right now, I have got Mattis Olson. He is a screenwriter. Hi. He is also the director of the original film, which we will get into as well. Uh, we will soon have John Hyams, who is the director of Alone. We, oh, there he is. Hello, John. Hello. Uh, we will also soon have, uh, we will still, uh, Henrik P. Exen. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, he is the producer of both versions. And um, uh, Jules Wilcox, who is our star, and Mark Menchaka, who is her co-star and who is the most terrifying man alive, give or take one or two people in positions of political power. Um, before I begin, big shout out, big thanks to our friends at CJLO for providing the music, the slideshow music. Although, you know, you guys had this, um, this is just to, to Angelica and Andrew at CJLO. You had this perfect setup. You have a movie called Alone. You could have played Alone by heart, but you didn't. I'm going to give you crap for that next time. But anyway, let's talk about this terrific movie. Uh, this is an unusual situation because it's not uncommon for a European film to be re remade in America. It's happening quite a bit these days. It is pretty uncommon, though, for the original director to be so intimately involved in this remake. So, John and Mattis, let's talk a bit about uh, getting this project going and working together on this particular version. Well, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. This is really awesome to get thank to talk to you guys. Uh, well, the story of Alone, or also Forsvunnen, that was the original film, goes back almost 15 years. Um, uh, the, the inspiration uh, for this film is very much... My, my, my favorite film uh, growing up was uh, Duel. Uh, you know Steven Spielberg's first film with a guy who gets, who gets chased by a tank truck. I love that movie. I used to watch it over and over. Uh, and also, I am. Um, I grew up in a village in southern Sweden, surrounded by forests on all sides. So I think um, this story was sort of a merge between my love for duel and the forest. I always love, you know, these kind of movies where you have a lone protagonist in a, some sort of desolate environment that gets uh, chased by someone or, or something. Uh, other influences would be like Breakdown and, and Hitcher and Deliverance. Um, so anyway, in 2004, um, I started writing uh, the first draft. Uh, Henrik and me uh, at the, this point had made uh, a couple of shorts and we, we really wanted to try to broaden ourselves a little bit. So um, I started writing uh, and the idea was to write something that we could potentially shoot down in Cascrona, which is our ho hometown, for a reasonably low budget, not very low, but you know, something that could be achievable. Uh, so the first draft was about uh, 50 pages or something, something like that. I showed that to Henrik and we thought, yeah, this is, this is good. We can, we can work with this. Uh, eventually I, um, I also had it as a project in, uh, in uh, my, the, the screenwriting sort of university I went to. Uh, so expanded it to about 100 pages or something. And um, the, the building blocks were in the remake was always there. Then when it came to the remake, we sort of improved the script a little bit. But uh, uh, the original, um, I, th I, say, I think we had a script that we were pretty satisfied with in 2008 or something like that. And then we started, you know, finding, finding the actors and locations. And, and Henry can, can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a, quite a long journey, of course, uh, as you know. Um, and um, the financing uh, took a while. Uh, we were first time directors. Uh, we co-directed the original film uh, and I produced it as a first time producer. Um, so, but, but by the time in 2010, we, we finally did it. So it was, 
yeah, it's 10 years right now. Uh, we, we, we shot it, I think, August, September uh, 2010. Um, and uh, then we made the, uh, the sound um, in, in Los Angeles uh, with a Swedish sound designer, um, Per Hal- Halberg, <clears throat> who, who has won several Academy Awards for, for Braveheart and Born Ultimatum and uh, Skyfall. And uh, while being there, we, we, we thought that we were going to sit in the sound stage um, with him uh, for all two, two months in LA, but of course we didn't. So uh, then we had a lot of spare time and then we just decided to, to develop the remake. And that's the story of, uh, that's the start of the story with Alone in January of 2011. And John, when did you come on board? Was this a situation where you saw the original film and you said, oh, this is great, I want to do this, or did somebody come to you with it? Yeah, it came to me as a script. Uh, Mike McCary, who I didn't know at the time, but somehow he had gotten in touch with me through a manager or a rep. Um, I think he'd seen uh, probably uh, my last uh, Universal Soldier Day of Reckoning, I think is what he had seen. Um, at that time, I had been I had done kind of stuff in in the action thriller genre. I'd been doing documentaries before that, and was doing TV, and and I was really interested in at the time, and it kind of came to me at that at that moment. I was really interested in in just doing a real suspense thriller, um, and I've always loved uh, and was kind of moving towards in my own mind at least, uh, just loving uh, and being more attracted to minimalism in, in, in all forms of art, I guess. And, and, and this script came to me, I'd, I'd never actually seen the original. I, so I just read the script um, and, and I was really knocked out by it because it, it was, I couldn't believe A, that the script uh, was written by people, or written by someone whose English was their second language, because that it it that was uh, it was very accomplished and and beautifully written. But it was everything I was really looking for in the in the kind of movies I loved and the kind I wanted to be making, where it was uh, so much was accomplished with a character uh, without dialogue and without obvious backstory and the way that the backstory was used was, was it really kind of was very gracefully woven into the story. And, and uh, so I was really knocked out by it. I reached back to uh, Mike McCary and, and pretty soon we had set up a meeting or a, I think it was a Skype call with Henrik and Matthias and talked to them just about, how how much I love the script and we discussed some different ideas of uh it was of how to even strip some things down even further because I I loved the way it was going that way and uh and everyone seemed to be game and so we spent a little time Matthias working on the script and then we would we would all read it and talk about it and we went through that that probably was 2013 and maybe it was a year ish I get probably a year of doing that. And, and then we tried to take it out and get financing. And it was interesting yeah. because at the time, uh, the amount of, you know, the amount of money you would go, you would try to raise for a, a film from the time I'd finished my last one in 2012 till 2015, that number was fast dwindling, you know, with the DVD market drying up. So, Gone were the days where you could really ask for, say, nine million for a movie like this. So we were like, well, let's make it for five million. Now, to, by today's standards, five seems exorbitant. And, and back then, it turned out it was too much because certainly with me directed uh, attached as a director, we could not raise the money and get it made. Um, I'm, I, at that time, was when I was really trying hard to break back into television and get, and get into series. And so around 2015, we, we parted ways basically just because I couldn't, 
they couldn't get the movie made with me attached. So it, the feeling was, um, you know, I, I, I wish you guys success. I, I wish I could have made this, but it just, it didn't seem to be in the cards. And then uh, I was off doing um, television for a while. And then I met, and, and that coincided with meeting uh, Jonathan Rosenthal and Jordan Foley of, uh, of at that time, Millhouse. Um, and that was making this, uh, the first feature that I made in a long time, this film, uh, this feature All Square that was uh, starring Michael Kelly and a beautiful cast of people. And, and it's a uh, terrific movie, by the way, if you haven't seen oh, it. It's a thanks. really terrific picture, yeah. Yeah, it was a, that was a great experience made by a lot of close friends. And in that process, with Jordan and Jonathan, these are people who are making movies for $750,000. And they had a, they had a way of doing it. And we, we made all square in the summer of 17, I believe. And immediately after shooting, we were kind of uh, just editing and they said, we want to make something in the fall. Do you have anything? I said, well, I don't have anything, but there's a movie that I think that I once really wanted to make that would be perfect for this model. I see now with the way you guys were able to work a lot of miracles in terms of just hustling and, and getting us the gear we needed. And, and really, they were, they were very savvy in staging a production and very hands-on. I mean, these were producers who were like driving the art truck to and from. They're driving the porta-potties to set every day. So they were super hands-on and they were just very crafty. So long story short, I basically reached out to Mike and said, hey, uh, whatever, whatever happened with the loan, is it still going? And, um, and nothing was happening. And I said, look, here's where it is right now. Um, there's really no money for any of us in this, but we can make this. That's sort of the offer right now. I mean, I'm not making any money. No one's going to make anything, but we get to make the movie. And at a certain point, that's kind of what features had become in my life anyway. These were like, uh, you know, it's like, it's like putting on an opera or a ballet. It's this exquisite art project that you get to be a part of and you work. I do television, you know, I was directing episodes of TV right before I started shooting this and right after just to pay for the time. But anyway, that was, that was the impetus. Uh, Mike and Henrik and Matthias all agreeing to kind of join forces with Jonathan and Jordan. And then also, of course, Yardley, Yardley and Ben, who are of, pap uh, of, of Paperclip. And so those are the companies that had put, uh, had put together All Square. And we just kind of quickly moved into this. And it was really a case of like, where do we want to do this? And we thought, well, um, th there was no tax incentive, anything, because it's like when the numbers are this low, it kind of doesn't make a difference. So it was like, well, we probably should shoot it in the Pacific Northwest. We want that kind of, we want that kind of rainforest climate. We want those kind of trees and that kind of awe-inspiring uh, landscape, because the landscape is very much a character in the story. Hey. And and, and, and really back to what Matthias said at the beginning, I mean, that was my feeling about it always. It was, you know, two of my favorite movies have always been Duel and Deliverance, you know, and, and, and it's because of that, because it was, to me, it's the idea of a thriller really kind of crystallized down to its essence where you strip away all of the, all of the kind of exposition and all the characters that are meaningless and you just strip it down to suspense in its barest bones. One person who's after another person out in the middle of nowhere. And um, so that's really, that's how it came about. And then it was about enlisting, it was about finding two incredible performers to fill these roles and-, uh, and, and Yeah, yeah. I, wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to get to that, to the casting of it because it is so dependent upon these two, these two characters and who plays them. And I mean, you really, you could not have found two better leads. And I'm not just saying that because you're both here on this call. Uh, so let me just, uh, Jules, I want to start with you because your character goes through a lot in this movie <laughs> in every 
sense of the word. Uh, mm -hmm. She is a woman who is dealing with a lot of grief and a lot of pain. And then she comes upon, comes upon this man who she is utterly terrified of, as are the rest of us, uh, and then thrust into a, a, a situation where her grief and her pain now have to be put aside in order to survive. Uh, this is not an easy part for anybody. You know, uh, anybody who says, oh, she just has to run and look scared. Uh, I don't think they quite get it. And so let's talk about, I mean, let's just talk about bringing this character to life and working with John and, and working with Mateus on, on this character as well. Well, John and I had met working on an episode of television where it was some rough, Stuck. Now, what show was this, by the way? Was this um, the... Chicago PD. Yes, okay. Chicago PD. You've done you've done Chicago PD and Chicago Fire, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, PD. Yeah. I'm a I'm a P Oh, John has yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, we'd already dealt with some like really traumatic material, but we'd also dealt with like a traumatic set situation where we're on a Friday night and the most emotional scene in the whole episode and sweet, loving, Hello. wonderful John comes up to me at the end of the take and says, okay, so we lost all the footage and we got to do it all again, but it's Friday night and everybody wants to go home. So, we just, we just, we're just gonna do it. We just got this one take to do it all over again. And we did it, and we did it. And um, so I think we'd, we'd been through, we'd been through that. <laughs> and it was, it was like- There was already a trial by fire. Stretched that experience into, you know, a whole feature shoot. <laughs> that is alone. <laughs> it and basically is, and I might, I might add just to Jules's story, she had to do three insanely emotional scenes in a hospital. She's been a, a, a victim of a horrible trauma. Three scenes, each one is more emotional than the next monologues. And literally this doesn't happen in network TV, but it happened, the entire card was erased and she had to re-perform every one of her scenes after spending an entire day doing them. Um, and she was equally amazing the second time around. And that when, when it came, when this script came around, she was honestly one of the first names I brought up and we had talked about a lot of people and it had a whole journey, but I said, I know one person who can handle this. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen well, what she's made of. You, you know what she could do emotionally, but the physical, end of this. I mean, this is, I mean, this is running and jumping and swimming and, you know, everything. And so from a physical standpoint, Jules, uh, doing this, playing this character, I mean, it's obviously, I'm sure there were a lot of bruises, a lot of sprains uh, to go with it. But I mean, was that something that you felt that you, was, was it what you were expecting? Was it worse than you were, than what you thought? I have always, like, I, I have a bit theater background, always doing stunts. When I was a kid, if you'd ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was Indiana Jones. Like, I wanted to be, like, I want to be the, I want to be, like, the adventure hero. And here we go. I get to do it, right? <laughs> and the first day of the second week of shooting, I broke my foot. Ooh. So then we shot the rest of the film in a walking boot and I have to give so much, so much credit to my stunt double, um, my uh, amazing uh, stunt woman, Michelle Damis. And John, John had worked with her prior to this and he knew that she was incredible. Um, and she was, she was. So a lot of that, I mean, I was in the rapids in a boot like strapped to our stunt coordinator so I don't float away with my walking boot. And John- that boot, that boot is also weighing you down a little bit too. And all this, everything, like, yeah. So it, it ended up being so much more than I thought it was gonna be. But then 
what that did was just add so much more a, a level of realism that like you could just I, I don't know you could just never make that up it's it's there it, it the the pain the pain is real <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was a, it was a really incredible scenario I mean it was the first day of action and and she broke I mean Jules legitimately broke her foot I mean she when she fights Mark at the end, she's in a boot. She has a broken foot. I mean, oh. she had a broken foot for the entire shoot. We did end up, she basically, we were able to heal her up and go back months later and shoot the basement stuff uh, and, a, and a few other things. But I mean, that was week one. And basically week one, she goes down and we were all faced with this thing, which is we call the insurance company, the producers came to me we can, we can collect all our money back, no harm, no foul, we can all go home and no one's lost a dime. You know, what should we do? And I think I drove home, I drove you home from set that day, Jules. And I said, look, um, this is, you know, this is where it's at. If you don't want to do it, I totally get it. But if there's any part of you that wants to do it, then we'll make it happen. You know, uh, and she was she was like, no, let's you know, I can't walk away now. We have to do it. And so then we started on figuring I out how to do can't it. Can't walk away now. I have. Yeah. A <laughs> <laughs> Literally, you can't. Yeah. And and um, and Mark, uh, I, I wanted to ask you the. It's, it's an amazing, it's a really amazing performance because you start off as a guy, you know right off the bat, he's, there's something not right about him. And then when he really reveals himself, you know, you're like, okay, yeah, he's, this is a bad guy, he's a sleazy guy. But the phone call, the, the, the scene where you're calling home, talking to your wife, talking to kids, I mean, that just added a layer to this guy I hated you even more. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that, you know, as a, as a compliment. Um, you know, how do you, for you, play, how do you play an evil guy like this who also supposedly is, is keeping a, you know, a regular person face on for family and friends and all of that? How, how do you bring something like this home with you? Um. Well, I mean, I think I think the phone call, there were a couple of things that uh, some just changes, not changes, but like some layers we I feel like we put in there. Like with the phone call, I feel like that's he's he's somehow comfortable in, in living whatever lie he's living. Um, and uh yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a super fun job for sure. I mean, and and, uh, and Jules and I had a great time together. It was quite painstaking to have to watch her do her job because I just had to be a, a, a this creepy son of a gun. Um, but uh, I don't know to, to answer your question. I the I feel like the phone call kind of like rounds the character out for me. Yeah. Yeah. It said it said the most about like who he was. Um and maybe I live a lie myself and so I uh <laughs> I kind of get it. <laughs> um but but yeah, no, I I feel like that 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 phone call it, for some reason it, it did ring true to me. Um, just in that you gotta, you gotta, you gotta put the face on so you can get back to your, uh, get back to the business of work. Well, that's, I mean, in that scene, I feel like that's the scene when I read it in the script that really, yeah. and I was really hooked. Once that's I read that scene, I thought, okay, this is, that's all I need to, that's all I need to know about this guy. That's, that makes this 10 times more interesting. And it's, it's, I mean, let's talk about that moment too, because it's such a great moment, not simply because, you know, he reveals this, uh, this side of his, uh, the side of his character that you weren't completely expecting, but also obviously 
you know, uh, Jules is, is in, you know, she's listening in. He doesn't know she's gotten out. So you've got that, but you also just as an audience member, you're sitting there like, get out of there, get the hell out of there, get the hell out of there, run as fast as you can. So uh, let's talk about the construction of it. Um, and, and Matt says, you know, taking that from the original picture, maybe improving it or improving on it, and then uh, working with the actors, working with John and, and bringing it to this a whole new level. Yeah, uh, well, interestingly, uh, for quite a long time in the development process of the original film, the, the man or the bad guy didn't have any lines. He was actually mute for quite a, quite a while. Um, eventually when we cast the original actor we felt like well he's so good we can't possibly us having him walk around saying nothing we need lines we need dialogue so initially he was more almost like a ghost type of a figure sort of like a force of nature um, but then we started developing the, the this character and uh, of course when it can, uh, there is a, a scene like this in the original film as well um, I think what changed um, was obviously this is a different setting. This is not Sweden anymore, so it, it's the U.S. So was all, what was for me personally always sort of like a kind of a scary thing was that I didn't want it to be sort of like, well, as a Swede, um, I didn't want to go like the cliche route. So it would be like, hi, honey, I'm having burgers at the bar. I'm coming home soon. I needed to find something that felt a bit more unique. So it wouldn't feel like there was a Swede trying to write pretend dialogue of what the, an American man might say. So it was just trying to find some, just this small little details that would make it um, believable. And of course, I mean, both of the actors pulled off so well, and it's, it was always, uh, I can't remember when we initially thought of the, of the concept, um, but I, I know that both me and Henrik felt like th this is a, it's one of the key scenes uh, in the film because this makes him more than just one dim dimensional kind of a character. It's just, you never, you get some clues also further down the line in the film about his, his private life. Um, but it was just just a way to make it more interesting uh, for also for, for the actors to play, obviously, than just being a kind of a, a standard psycho, so to speak. Well, yeah, and it makes I mean, it makes the, the makes the whole concept more compelling, it makes the character more compelling. Uh, and let's uh, let's also let's talk about you shooting a film in the, in the Pacific Northwest. You shot it in Oregon, correct? Yeah, we shot it in Portland um, again, and that was that was just like we we just made the decision it should be Portland because or it should be the area surrounding Portland, um, and and so we all we literally showed up there like four of us. I mean, I think it was you know Johnny and Jordan and myself with with no movie, and that's kind of the that's the beautiful thing about a, a movie. Uh, a feature which is kind of unlike anything else where you you literally are going somewhere and launching a business uh in the space of several months you're bringing the circus to town you know and you're uh so four of us showed up and we don't know any crew we don't know anything we just had some lodging and we so we showed up there and pretty soon they just, we put a cast and, or we put a crew together and, um, and then set about, you know, figuring out where we we're going to shoot it. We had, uh, you know, these great locations people and, and it all, you know, that all, of course, that always comes together, but I would like just for a moment to, uh, to sing Mark's praises a little bit because uh, he, do he doesn't do it for himself much. So just to say that this movie it doesn't work at all if we didn't find the right person for that. And it was really hard to figure out what we want. Do you want someone, you can't have someone who is obviously kind of uh, 
crazy. Just a, a run of the mill crazy guy who's sort of pathetic. And then you're just going to watch this and I don't know what you're going to be feeling. Am I going to celebrate his downfall? Or am I going to feel bad for him? What am I going to feel? You need, and you can't bring someone who just feels like you're casting some leading man type who's just going to kind of pretend to be a bad guy. You need someone who come somehow can play both sides equally well so that in the first, you know, half of the movie and certainly the first third of it, he's, you're, you're, you're entertained by him and you're afraid of him and he's weird, but you want to keep watching him. And that's the thing about Mark. He's just, as a performer, he's just compelling. You just want to watch him. You want to listen to his voice. Anything I've seen him in, he's always the most compelling person on screen when he's in it. And uh, we were lucky to have him. We had a mutual friend. So his trust of our friend is the only reason he came to work for me. And I'm thrilled because uh, because he he's a, he's a, he's a, he sells snake oil and he sold it pretty good. <laughs> so we got a good buddy in Michael Kelly who made this happen and convinced uh, Menchaca to come out. And and it was really I don't think Jules could have done what she did without having the trust in Mark and. You know, he's a very physical guy, so he can handle the physicality, but that's just a part of it. Um, it was the whole thing. So there's no way that, like, this thing is pulled off in any way without – I mean, we just really lucked out yeah. with these two performers. But but Mark especially, I mean, that was like uh, – well, not Mark especially, but we haven't said it. We talked about Jules. I just want to talk about Mark and say – this guy and everyone, the world kind of knows about him now. If you've seen him in The Outsider, if you've seen him in Ozark, you know what he's capable of. But uh, it was we were we were lucky to have the right counterpart for Jules in this. Otherwise, the whole thing just doesn't work at all. Now, uh, Jules and Mark, was this a situation where you guys kept a distance, or was that just physically impossible? Because you are pretty much the only, with the exception of Anthony Heald, who comes in. Uh, you're pretty much the only two characters in the movie. How did you, how did you two decide to to work this out? We, still we didn't keep distance. <laughs> I wouldn't say, no, we, <laughs> I, I don't think we kept, kept any distance between us. Oh, no, um, we had to trust each other. We had to, I mean, it's, it, I think I, we had, we had fun. We really did because it's like, really tense you know our interactions we don't have any a lot of verbal interactions yeah. so when we had those it was like it it, it the, to have the tension to break the tension when we were done shooting was just necessary as human beings you know because it was always just very tense between us on, on set on um, when the cameras were rolling yeah i would i would say that uh well for me, knowing because because we are, you know, the it was it was fairly intense when we were shooting, uh, and knowing when you can, um, knowing when I could I, I could maybe pull one over on on Jules when it wasn't a heavy scene for her, or uh, when I knew we maybe had the shot, and then doing something just to like lighten the mood. That there was, it was, there was a, a fine line to, yeah. to walk on on doing that stuff, but um, yeah, we, I, I would say that we, we kind of, we just like buddied up uh, from the moment that we met. <clears throat> because also the grueling conditions that we're in, it was, you know, you, you had to have, there had to be some levity because it was freaking cold <laughs> let's yeah let's ask let's talk a bit about you know shooting that you know in the wilderness i mean you could say one of the upsides is it's you know you're not building sets you know you're you're working off of what nature is providing and and up there nature's providing a lot but you're still dealing you know it's it can be unpredictable in, in a lot of ways you know beyond just oh it may start raining you know you don't know when your lead actor is going to fall into a ditch by accident or something like that well it was kind of cool because we did shoot like it would start raining and we'd just like 
shoot. And then if it stopped raining, then that was the way it happened. I felt like, you know, like we didn't, yeah, we didn't yeah, then stop we rain on you. <laughs> huh? And then we dumped rain on you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. As well. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, the, the thing that people often don't uh, realize and nor should you when you're watching a movie is that you have to like get a whole company of people and gear there. So shooting in the woods, it's not so simple as just, you know, running out there and doing it, especially if you're trying to uh, do it in a certain way. And, and our, our DP, uh, Federico Verarde, who I, uh, I would have to mention here because he was a key oh, collaborator yeah. on this. Yeah. And because we knew from the get-go, we also, even though it was low budget, all that, we didn't want to just run around with handheld cameras to do it. Not, there's nothing wrong with that. I love that. And, and I love a cinema verite style, but we felt like this needed a little bit of a, um, a kind of composed classic style that, that, it, that we were just kind of honoring the genre, the thriller genre. And we were going to kind of service it as a thriller. And that was going to require sometimes for the camera to be you know very steady and 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 have these kind of uh, be able to create mood through that and and Fetty is you know is a very sensitive with light and and he really I thought he did a beautiful job absolutely uh, it was very difficult uh to do something like that on that budget and to still be like really working to try to create beautiful images and control the light. And he really did. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to do it. It's very difficult to get that gear out there and make the effort when you, your, your instinct is like, let's just grab a camera and run out there and do this. Cause this is crazy. But you know, Fetty had the patience and the desire to, to want to make it, you know, look and feel the way it did. So uh, he, he deserves tremendous credit. He's got a great eye. He's a great cinematographer. And, um, and so that, that's a part of it too. So that was, that was a challenge. How do you, you know, find in these locations, okay, here's a big, cool rock formation, but how do we shoot at this rock formation? Where are we going to, where are we going to hang the, uh, you know, the condor? Where are we going to put a weather, you know, weather balloon, you know, the lights, how are we going to put the rain towers here? All that stuff. So I just think that, you know, the combination of, of, of Jordan and Johnny and their ability to kind of make some slick deals in getting all the gear out there and, uh, you know, very game performers and, and then having, uh, I think, a guy leading your crew, a DP who's really trying to um, create, you know, go the extra effort for the images. Um, I think that's, you know, that, again, it's, it, Hopefully it doesn't look difficult. Hopefully you're just watching it and enjoying it, but it is, it is, uh, it is really tricky to pull those things off with those kind of limitations. And did Matz's experience on the original picture, did that inform you in any way? Did he give you tips about shooting in the wilderness? I mean, you obviously have directed a lot, uh, but uh, I'm curious to know, did he give you any tips on that? Uh, well, Matthias, you know, we, they, they, they were on set for a period of time. And I mean, I think, you know, we, we will certainly share experiences of uh, our relative experiences. And I think, and he, in many ways in making this movie, to me, it was important that I, I saw their movie and I think they did a brilliant job with it, but I really, based this movie on the script that he wrote and 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 not on the other movie because you don't want to get caught up in that and sure. what did they do that we can't do what they did there i sort of did never thought about that i just said let's i'm going to take this script and how do we make this script that 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 matthias wrote so it was really about honoring his script and we you know the movie you see is very close to the script quite frankly it's not it it, it we didn't really veer off course from the script that that was that was written um the, from dialogue to the situations it's that stuff was really um conceived on the page 
And uh, Matthias and Henrik, you know, for you guys, having gone through the experience of making the original picture, to see it now in an Americanized version, although, although be it pretty close to your original version, uh, you know, how was that for, for you guys? It's of course a fantastic experience. And I mean, as, as Jan says, uh, it's very close to the script, uh, which we've been discussing and developing for so many years. Uh, and all the, the, uh, the parts that we, 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 we put there to, to um, enhance the original version to be a better version. Uh, I mean, John did a, such a great job. And, and I have to say that, uh, yes, so we don't forget uh, our fantastic co-producer, uh, Mike McCary, um, which is not in this call, but he's been a true part of, of development um, of, of the remake. Uh, of, of, of the loan, of course, um, and, and we're so happy for everything. Uh, I mean, John, John did such an amazing job, truly, yeah. And I mean, we, 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 we felt that meeting him in so many years ago, uh, he, he, really, he really sold us, um, uh, sold us why, he was, why he was the right director. Yeah. Yeah, I agree completely with what Henrik said. Uh, it was it's been very gratifying and very actually surreal experience also to. Uh, it's very, I, I mean, when you do a film or any type of project, you always look back and think, well, maybe we could have done. I could have done this different and this different. Um, and it's very rare that you actually get the chance to see a new version of a film that you have done. Um, I would say the script is probably, I mean, me and Henrik discussed this a lot and I think we come to the conclusion that this, it's about 20-25% uh, different, I would say, probably. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know if we, can, if we can go into spoiler territory here, but I would just say that there is a scene in, in, about in the latter, later half of the film where the man is taunting uh, Jessica to show herself. And he's using the information he has gotten that she has suffered a loss previously. That wasn't in the original film. Um, in the original, it was more just kind of a chasing each other through the woods sort of stuff. So that scene is sort of like, it's such an impo important moment for the character. Um, yes. So that was really fun to see that. Um, being realized on the on the on the we screen. always felt we always felt in the original that we had like a truly fantastic scene in the basement um and we we didn't really want to expand that scene but we all in, in the same time we wanted to 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 have have more of of the same uh just to have a closure and i think that's what Matthias so brilliant, brilliantly uh, wrote with, with this scene, which he's talking about in, in, the, in the woods. It became like a second, second half of, of the first scene in, 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 in the basement. And yeah. Uh, and and we, we have to say also that, that I mean, um, w when, when John called us in August of uh, 2017, and we started to shoot the film in, I think they started shoot in October and we came in in November because it's all, it's, it was so fast. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's amazing also. <laughs> uh, I've got some questions here from audience members. Uh, I've got a question here from Guillaume asking, I was wondering why there is a rocking chair sound during the end credits. Uh, it's actually not a rocking chair sound. It is the sound of uh, trees creaking, ah. trees moving in the wind. No. You did that so beautifully, John. Yeah, thank you. I done moving. <laughs> <laughs> training, dance training. Yeah. yeah. John's also John has also has had a lot of training in front of uh, auto dealerships. That's right. <laughs> <That's a> big... <laughs> Quite inflatable. <laughs> that was, yeah, one of those. Uh, Dan has a question. Uh, how did the characters get refined once Jules and Mark started inhabiting them? 
And he also wants you to know, Mark, that you were fucking terrifying. Uh, how did they get refined? <clears throat> That's a question for both of you guys. I, I mean, for me, I think it was, uh, I, we, you know, we, I mean, we kind of just like rolled with the punches every day to see what, see what happened. Um, I mean, there, there, for, for me, there were a few things like, I, I think one of, I, one of the, things that really kind of like grounded me with the character was um, one, the, the phone call. Um, and I feel like he, uh, you know, like that part of his life feeds off of this other part of his life, which also feeds off of this other, you know, I, I feel like it's kind of this revolving circle, but um, he doesn't speak to his wife the way he speaks to Jessica um, and I won't say when but there but I but I also we found in this one scene that uh, I remember John and I were talking about it uh, before we shot it but there's a moment where he gets where like he gets um, he starts to get nervous that this may not uh it may not work out this time and there's a there's also kind of a vocal change there in that in that part but uh yeah i mean it was fun just like i felt like john and i um just figured it out as we went and like found these little moments that were like oh that's you know that that would be cool and um I don't know. I mean, John was great to work with. He, it was not only was it was it hilariously uh, fun, but it was also just as like taking away how how much fun we had and just getting down to the work. It was, you know, I mean that I, it was it was always a very smooth smooth road, um, and there wasn't. I don't know. It was he 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 knew how to how to get to the point of what we needed to get to. So. Yeah. And he, uh, and he got it. He got a great, he did get a great shot. I, I don't know if we, we should just mention it real quick. John had a, had an amazing shot in the film. He can tell you about it later. He nearly got a haircut <laughs> by the car, but <laughs> go ahead, Joyce. Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. Go ahead, Jules. Um, no, I, I just wanted to piggyback on that and, and agree that a, a lot of it was this, you know, drives, drives home with John um, because he was also the chauffeur <laughs> <laughs> at times. Um, but yeah, just, I think we, once the injury happened, we were so forced just to, to improv with that to be in a dance with the, the physicality of, of the, the real injury and the environment. It, it was all just very present. It didn't feel like there, there was, there wasn't like, it was for me, it was less agenda and it was more of like problem solving. It was constantly talking about like, okay, so critically thinking her way through or physically or instinctually finding her way through this moment and then this moment and then this moment because we shot pretty much in sequence and then just, there's there's the man on the page and then there's mark playing the man which is like utterly terrifying and you know so different from the the man that he is you know so to to feel that difference when the camera's rolling was just you know that that was how it got refined was just in reaction and the realness and the rawness between the two characters and i've got time for one more question it is from benny uh question is for jules i think we touched upon this before but what scene uh, what scene did you find the most difficult for you to film? Uh, um, God, 
gosh, they, there's so many different challenges. The basement scene was really like emotionally very, very, very difficult. Um, just to go there and to, to, to be provoked in that way by the man um, and to be utterly helpless because she's such a, you know, a trapped animal at that point. And to be like, how do you keep fighting? How do you keep going at like that moment? And from that moment on, she's, you know, she is fighting. And um, I think physically probably the, um, the last scene of the film or in the white water rapids with a broken foot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we have to wrap up, but we want to take this opportunity to thank the team from Alone, Mattis, John, Mark, Jules, Henrik. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to everyone for uh, sticking around for the Q&A. Uh, the film is opening September, I think it's uh, 18th, 19th? Yeah, I so, yes. And uh, it's in the U.S. Is it opening in Canada as well? Do you know? That, that's a great question. I don't actually know the answer if it's going to be theatrical in Canada at that time. It'll, I think it will, but it will be day and date. So there will be, it will be available on demand for sure at that time. Great. And uh, we want uh, if all you guys uh, to follow the film. Talk If you like the film, please talk about it on social media. The movie's going to be out in a couple of weeks. And we want you guys to start tooting the horn for it. Uh, follow the movie on social media. Follow Fantasia on social media and thank you all once again for being here it has been an honor to have you here john it's a pleasure to finally have you at fantasia we hope to have you all back sometime in the near future and uh thank you all for coming bon cinema thank you so much for having us it's an honor yeah, thank you very much thank you, thank you.